Corey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking some time on a, on a beautiful day in Regina to uh, be with me uh, for my uh, for my discussion today. It's uh, certainly an exciting time. We did have a, a great discussion at our table about uh, some of the economic growth that is happening uh, both in the city, but also uh, Saskatchewan-wide. It is uh, great to see the uh, record-breaking economic numbers from Saskatchewan, uh, the increase in the population uh, as found out in the latest uh, census and the, all of the opportunities that are here are from uh, everything from agriculture and uh, mining and natural resources to, uh, to the services uh, that are uh, part and parcel of economic growth as well. Uh, this is truly the new land of opportunity. We were talking a little bit about um, the premiers of a visit to Ireland uh, recently and uh, how emotional that was, but uh, how people were literally lining up around the block to uh, learn more about uh, becoming uh, part and parcel of the economic, uh, the economic situation here in Saskatchewan. So uh, this is a place where ingenuity and uh, the aspirations and the determination of people, either newcomers or people who've been here for generations, uh, can be uh, met and uh, really it is a great Canadian story, not just a great Saskatchewan story. I uh, I am going to be talking a little bit about uh, uh, three ways uh, the government is helping to leverage our country's economic strength. So I will be looking at the economic situation that Canada faces today. Uh, I'll also be looking at some of the ways government is helping businesses succeed. And third, I'll be talking about uh, the use of new communications platforms to transform the way that uh, government can serve Canadians better. Now, I'm, uh, as uh, Corey mentioned, the president of the Treasury Board, which uh, probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you. Tom, uh, Tom, uh, Tom knows it means a lot to some people in Ottawa, but it's uh, hard to describe. Although, when I'm in Washington, I must say, when I'm in Washington, uh, uh, to say you're president of the Treasury Board, actually, they think, wow, you've got president and treasury in your name. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure what it means. Uh, the story I like to tell, a true story, um, uh, when I was uh, elevated to this position by the Prime Minister after the last election, uh, just about three weeks after the election, there was a state visit that the Prime Minister was doing to, of all places, Greece. And he asked me to come along uh, because uh, my father's uh, Greek, uh, Greek heritage, and so uh, uh, they wanted me along for the ride and talk a little bit. Since we were talking about balancing budgets and things like that, uh, they wanted me along for that, those discussions as well. A week before the visit, however, as, as is typically the case, um, there was a person from, the prime, from our Prime Minister's office who would have been helping to organize the visit a little bit, and he was having discussions with the Prime Minister's office in Greece going over the schedule of Prime Minister Harper and, oh, by the way, uh, Tony Clement is coming along, his father's a Greek heritage, uh, he's, uh, he's president of the Treasury Board. And the, the Greeks uh, asked, what's a president of the Treasury Board? And uh, this uh, person from Mr. Harper's office said, well, before any minister can spend a dime, he has to get the approval of the president of the Treasury Board. And the Greeks said, well, that's a really good idea. We should have thought that. <laughs> that gives you a little bit of a sense of what the president of the Treasury Board is. Uh, and of course, um, uh, we're having this discussion in the context. The context is that uh, uh, we delivered our uh, our budget uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and uh, and uh, it is in the the context of some of the challenges that we as Canadians face. Uh, uh, they're a little bit different, perhaps, than some of the challenges of our trading partners, uh, because we do have labor shortages and uh, we have the need to make sure that we can meet the growth that is inherent in our economy. Uh, at the same time, we know that the, the global recovery uh, has been slower than people would have hoped. Uh, it is fragile, we know that. We know that our Canadian economy has performed rather well against uh, the uh, relative to uh, the other uh, developed countries, which is good news for, for us. Uh, I would say that our, when you look at our gross domestic product, our GDP, uh, it is now si significantly above pre-recession levels. Uh, it is the strongest job growth 
here in Canada amongst the G7 highly industrialized countries uh, over the course of the recovery. Uh, since, uh, since the depths of the recession, which uh, is almost three years ago now, our, our economy has added uh, 690,000 net new jobs in our economy. Uh, and uh, that, of course, uh, was aided by the latest job news that just came out last week uh, for the month of March, where 82,000 jobs uh, were added just in the month of March alone. Uh, that is good news across Canada. A lot of the growth has happened in Western Canada, but those numbers were significant because uh, of the uh, most of those uh, increased job numbers were in Ontario and Quebec, er areas of the country that had not seen large job growth in the past. So that is a good that is a good sign as well. But we know, uh, being Canadians, and you know, uh, here in Saskatchewan, probably better than most, that uh, we do look to the global economy for signs of future economic growth. And we, we know that when parts of the world uh, face economic difficulty, it, it can impact on our ability to create jobs and opportunities. So we, we cannot rest on our laurels. We, we know that we have to keep making the right public policy decisions, uh, both in the, in the provincial governments across the country, but also, of course, at the federal level as well. As well. We know that no country is immune to these new challenges. Uh, you just have to look uh, either across the pond at the Eurozone, where they continue to grapple with uh, the high debt levels in uh, certain countries. Look at the UK, uh, where they are currently reducing the size of their public service by 500,000 people. That's just the reduction. And it shows uh, the depths uh, of the recession that they were facing and some of the issues of, uh, of uh, growth in public sector debt that they were facing. Of course, in the United States, uh, we've seen some positive signs in the economy uh, south of the border. But at the same time, people are waiting for Washington to make some decisions. And we know, being Canadians, that uh, because of their electoral cycle, those decisions are not likely to be made until January after the congressional elections and after the presidential elections. So uh, a lot of question marks in the United States. That's the context. Uh, good news in Canada, still some mixed news outside of our borders, which means that we cannot rest on the and have to continue to make the right decisions. And I think one of the uh, one of the indicators of the right set of decisions uh, was Budget 2012. It allowed us to face uh, these realities. It allows us to emerge, continue to see new signs of growth, stronger than ever. And really, the focus in Budget 2012, which was more than just the ledger, the typical ledger of revenues and expenses that one would find in a typical uh, public sector budget, that's a given. But the Budget 2012 went far beyond that in terms of identifying the drivers of job creation uh, and long-term growth and prosperity and focusing in on those. Uh, innovation, investment, education, skills development, and supporting our communities. Those are <coughs> themes that you'll find uh, in Budget 2012, and certainly there are new measures in each of those areas uh, to uh, strengthen our economy and really draw on the entrepreneurial sector's role uh, as a driving force behind economic growth. And the, as a chamber, you know that. That's part of who you are. That's part of your uh, your own uh, job or your own uh, business. But it's also something that has to be uh, represented and reflected in a budget. And that's what we did in Budget 2012. We are, of course, still funding programs that are important uh, to the fabric of our society or that are a priority uh, for Canadians. And really striking the right balance, the right balance between supporting economic growth and job creation, but returning to balance in our own budget, returning to a balanced budget in three years' time uh, at the outside. So that really brings me to my second point, and I want to sort of drill down on some aspects of the budget uh, and, and show you how uh, the government is helping Canadian business to succeed, because that really, as I say, is the key to economic growth in the future. Uh, of course, we've done a lot already. We've done much to make it easier 
for Canadian businesses to get ahead. Uh, we know that, uh, that low taxes, uh, which continues to be our mantra, uh, does help an economy compete. It helps businesses to grow, and uh, that has been something that we have continued in this budget. But we also know that businesses must be supported by a modern regulatory environment that helps promote competition, uh, business investment, and economic growth. And really, uh, it's not just about an efficient and low tax system uh, or a well-functioning financial system. I'm glad our bankers are here today. Uh, but it means other things as well. For instance, access to international markets. That's got to be a key growth as well. And when you look at some of the key commitments we've made, all of those areas, of course, uh, will be improved. Let me talk a little bit about something that I'm very much involved in as President of the Treasury Board, and that's cutting red tape, reducing the regulatory burden on our businesses, particularly our small and medium-sized businesses that are represented, uh, well represented by the Chamber, of course. We know, and you know as business people, I know as a former small business owner myself, that we know that red tape uh, impedes uh, economic productivity. In fact, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business uh, estimates that the, uh, when you add up all the cost of the regulatory work on Canadian businesses, just Canadian businesses, lost time, uh, di diverting time and attention away from your business because you've got to fill out forms. I remember, small business owner myself, you know, the, the forms would come in and you'd be filling them out in triplicate, answering all these questions, spending a day or days to do that. You send them in, and then the next day, another department or agency, maybe in the same level of government or a different level of government, asking the same questions again. I see the heads on it. You know what I'm talking about. All of that, that does cost the economy because it is diverting time and attention away from creating wealth. The total cost of red tape is around $30 billion every year for our businesses. So this is a big problem, a very big problem. And uh, when you cut red tape, when you reduce the regulatory burden, I'm not talking about health and safety and the things that we want. We want a safe, we want a, a safe society. But when you cut those things, you are helping small businesses invest. You're helping small businesses stay competitive, uh, and they're spending less time uh, complying with redundant regulatory requirements. And so it helps us with our economic recovery. Obviously, it helps us create jobs and grow. Uh, and that's why it's important. That's why it's part of our budget. That's why it's, a, it's an important initiative. It's part of the job that I'm doing as president of the Treasury Board. So we, uh, we had created, uh, the Prime Minister Harper, before the last election actually, had created a red tape reduction commission, which had not only MPs uh, on it, but it also had representatives of small business at the table. They went around the country. They heard from small businesses. Perhaps they had a, a session here in I know they had sessions in Saskatchewan for sure. And they came up with a number of recommendations on how to reduce the rate of burden. Uh, I accepted uh, that report. I will be acting on it. But one of the things I did, the minute I got the report, the minute I got the report was to announce that we were, as a government, accepting <coughs> what is called the one-for-one one rule. It just came into effect on it on just the beginning of this month. And uh, this is a direct effort to show the administration, uh, administrative burden on business. Uh, it means that uh, for those departments of the federal government that are regulating, uh, there is a new rule, started April 1st, that says for every new rule you put into place that affects small business, you've got to find one of the old redundant rules that is still there, not having any impact, uh, a regulatory burden, doesn't affect health or safety, you got to find one of those rules and take it off the books. That's the one for one rule. And it's an important rule. I'll tell you why it's important. First of all, it means that the additional burden uh, on small business uh, will, will not be the case. That uh, we'll make sure that the rules be taken off the books. You can't have a rule taken off the books that's two lines and then a rule being on the books that's uh, 80 pages. So it's got to be commensurate. That's another key aspect of this. And we're going to make sure that, that we're not adding, at least, to, to the regulatory burden while we're reducing red tape in other areas. But the other thing it does, and I, I think this is a very important, it starts to change the culture in official Ottawa. And uh, Tom knows this as well, of course, that 
really the, the structure of things in Ottawa is when you're faced with a problem, we've got a problem, what do we do? Okay, let's regulate it. That's the, that's the go-to uh, for every problem that uh, arises. We've got to change the culture there so that the, the go-to point is not to find a new regulation to solve a problem. There's lots of ways to solve problems. You don't have to automatically go to regulation. And so we're, the, the way you get that through to the system is you have something like a one-for-one -one rule because what you're doing is you're adding the cost of trying to find a, or to, trying to create a new regulation. That's why it's important. It changes the mindset. So when we have problems that need to be solved, we're not always going to regulation. There's lots of other things that we could do that could solve a problem without adding to the regulatory burden of small business. And so that must stop, and that's why this rule is important. Let me also talk about, uh, I think, something that's very important for Saskatchewan, which is the, the new era of regulatory cooperation with the United States. Now, uh, Prime Minister Harper was uh, in Washington. He's been there a couple times since then. But in December, he was there to announce with President Obama uh, the new uh, Beyond the Border initiative, which included some security measures, uh, of course. But it also included a new Canada-U.S. Regulatory Cooperation Council, and I'm, I'm involved in that process as well. But the, basically, the idea is to make sure the border isn't, isn't getting any thicker, that we actually try to thin the border for businesses operating on both sides of the border. We know that two-way trade uh, with the United States is a uh, billion dollars a day, uh, and so this is our most important uh, trade relationship. And so we are finding ways to lower costs for business on both sides of the border, reduce the administrative burden, have more efficient cross-border trading, and as I say, I'm happy to be involved with that as the president. Or president. I'll give you a couple of examples. One is pest control regulations, uh, you know, something of, of uh, great importance to uh, Saskatchewan farmers. Uh, why do we need two sets of regulations, one north, one south of the border, when it comes to uh, pest control, pest management? Uh, very easy to make sure health and safety is looked after, but have a common set of regulations so it's easier to import or export pest control. Uh, chemicals, as an example. <coughs> Another one that's perhaps more germane to Ontario, but is important for us as Canadians as well, is uh, we're, we're into a new world of uh, new hybrid uh, car vehicles, uh, obviously, uh, that uh, or fully electric vehicles that rely on long life batteries. Uh, that, uh, but of course, those batteries have to be safe. And so there will be some regulations, some safety regulations relating to car batteries. But these are going to be new regulations, and the question we have to ask ourselves is why do we need one set of regulations in Canada and another set of regulations in the United States? Let's have one common set of regulations so that when Canadians uh, create long life car batteries, they'll have immediate access uh, to the American market and vice versa. And so again, common sense, uh, before we create new regulations, let's make sure that we can, we can harmonize and make them coherent on both sides of the border. Let me talk a little bit about the budget and natural resources, of course, very important to uh, this province and, uh, and other provinces as well. And Budget 2012 uh, did uh, take action to leverage our natural resources potential, new measures to support uh, energy and mineral exploration. Uh, and of course, uh, we were talking about this at the table, that we cannot be in a, in a situation where with our large uh, projects, be they pipelines or or mines, they cannot take 10 years to complete the reviews uh, and consultations on those projects. Yes, we need reviews. Yes, we need consultations. But when it becomes an end in itself, without ever any ending to it, uh, it actually is not in the national interest. So we are very committed to one project, one review. You will be hearing from us in the weeks ahead on how we intend to move on this. And I think this will be good news for uh, any province, uh, which most provinces, uh, that have natural resources uh, that they uh, seek to exploit and develop and find the markets for. And I think this is going to be important for our future economic growth as well. Let me talk a little bit about trade, because again, this is something that uh, uh, the Chamber, and I'm sure Saskatchewan cares a lot about. Uh, we are, we want to continue to trade on a global scale. And uh, what the budget did signal is that we will be expanding trade, opening new markets for Canadian businesses. We recognize that restrictions on imports and investment uh, stifle our, our exporters, but at the same time, uh, we have sought 
bilateral and multilateral agreements with many, many countries. And uh, indeed, uh, we've, uh, in less than six years, concluded new free trade agreements with nine countries. We have, uh, we have brought into force foreign investment uh, promotion and protection agreements with 10 other countries and are in negotiations with 10 others. And, and of course, you've seen from the Prime Minister's travels that we are serious about opening up new markets. Canada, China. Uh, it's a very successful trip to China recently. Canada, Korea. Canada, Thailand. Canada, Japan. Canada, India. Obviously, these are all, uh, most of them are high growth or highly developed economies. Uh, great new markets for uh, our finished and our natural resources, goods. Canada, EU, uh, another important uh, trade negotiation taking place right now, uh, which uh, promises to give us greater access to a market of 540 million consumers, rich consumers. They weren't not as rich as last year, but still rich. Uh, and, uh, and of course, that's going to be important, uh, as, as important as uh, our trade with the United States is to have those new markets. It's going to be important for our future growth and opportunity. Finally, uh, on just talking about the budget, let me just talk about people, because obviously that's uh, something that uh, our ultimately our success as a nation rests upon, the full productive potential of people. And obviously, uh, when you look at the budget, you will see uh, significant investments in training, in infrastructure, new opportunities, job creation by small businesses. We want to, uh, we want to reduce the cost of hiring new workers for small businesses. That's why we extended the EI hiring credit uh, for small businesses for, for another year. And we're investing as well. This isn't uh, just a budget about, uh, about uh, spending within our means, but where we find areas where we should invest, we are investing. So we are investing in business R&D. Uh, we're doubling the investment in the IRAP program, which is there specifically to help small businesses commercialize their in innovations. We are changing around and making better as a result of uh, some, uh, some great recommendations from a small business committee. Our business support for R&D, because while our support for public R&D and universities and so on is second to none in the, in the highly industrialized world, we are, we are falling behind in the results of uh, business R&D and how to make sure those are commercialized and find their place to markets. We were talking a little bit as well, we were talking about people, about training. And uh, this, uh, this is not only about, uh, this is about training uh, ourselves to make sure our kids and our grandkids get the proper training and we are investing the resources in that. But also new investments in the budget for training uh, those on First Nations reserves. And I know Saskatchewan has had some success in this. We've got to have these successes across the country because if you've got 70% unemployment on reserve while at the same time having job shortages or skilled job shortages, uh, you know, where we're developing our resources, clearly that's not an acceptable situation. So you'll be hearing more in the weeks ahead about how we intend to get better training uh, on reserve. But it also means finding the right newcomers um, and having better immigration policies. And uh, as, I, uh, as I listen to these stories about uh, Premier Wall's trip to Ireland, uh, it, it, it really underlined the point that we've got to do a better job of proactively just as that trip was, proactively finding those with the right skills rather than just waiting for the applications to come in. And we've had a, we've had a situation where uh, skilled people apply to come to Canada even, and, uh, and there is uh, an eight-year wait for a reply. Uh, you know, by then they're probably in Australia. So that's not good enough. And uh, while I'm here talking to you, uh, Jason Kenny's in Saskatoon, talking about how we're going to change that system around, how we're going to focus in on proactively finding the people with the right skills and finding a quicker way, a much quicker way, weeks rather than years, of getting them to, to a yes in the system so they can be uh, accepted into our society and find that right job which will help our economy grow as well. So that is part of our budget as well. Let me uh, finally talk a little bit about something else I'm involved in as Treasury Board President, which I think uh, has some resonance for small business, and that's talking about uh, open government. And uh, uh, let me just uh, first of all say a little bit of history on, on this file, what this, what this means. Uh, we have, since uh, our first election in 2006, endorsed the principles of transparency and accountability. In fact, Canada was one of the first countries to enact access to information. When we got out of power, we immediately um, 
uh, created something called the Federal Accountability Act, uh, which expanded the coverage of the access to information legislation. And we brought new measures to help strengthen accountability and increase the transparency and oversight in government operations. In addition, uh, federal departments and agencies are required, are required to proactively disclose information about contracts, grants and contributions, as well as hospitality and travel expenses to ensure that Canadians and Parliament uh, have uh, a better ability to hold uh, the government and public sector officials, bureaucrats, uh, into account. Another uh, government-wide initiative was launched uh, last year, last uh, March 2011, to expand open government and enhance transparency and accountability to Canadians. And, uh, this commitment to advance open government principles was reconfirmed after we won re-election in May uh, and was found in our speech on the throne in June of last year. So the Open Government Initiative is, part, is not only about what Canada is doing, but we're actually part of an open government movement around the world. It's a broader international partnership with 54 like-minded countries called the Open Government Partnership. And one of uh, our commitments is to present an action plan to open uh, the action plan will be related to open government and will demonstrate Canada's commitment to provide Canadians with easier and improved access to the government. And uh, I'm using part of my speech today to make this announcement that, uh, that uh, we, will, we have completed Canada's first ever open government action plan. And this uh, action plan was shaped by public consultations, including the first ever live Twitter chat that I did. Uh, with Canadians uh, by the government of Canada. And uh, I wanted to share just a couple of elements of this Open Government Action Plan with you. First, there are 12 initiatives in our Open Government Action Plan, fit into three streams that our government will begin implementing over the next three years. The three streams are open information, open data, and open dialogue. Uh, first, uh, open information. Uh, this is about proactively releasing information on government activities. In this area, for example, we will be working with departments to make their publications and their scientific data and research results more openly available. And this will have a number of uh, benefits. It will increase the ability of non-government researchers to use and build on the knowledge that has been acquired uh, through government research. It will enable authors to reach a broader audience and increase the impact of their research and it will increase the awareness of research findings for policymakers and the public. We'll also be implementing a new universal open government license, and this will remove restrictions on the reuse of any published government candidate information, and will provide the reuse of this information in innovative ways. Just to give you an example, any published government report would be automatically available and will have fewer legal barriers to reuse by the public. Canadians also told us they wanted a one-stop uh, shop portal for government information with a user-friendly search engine that searches all Government of Canada websites simultaneously. We are certainly committed to developing a more efficient way for users to easily find the services and information they're looking for, and I will be consulting further with the users to find the right approach to that. Open data. We're also taking measures to make data more freely available to all Canadians in an open and usable format. Uh, we already have an open data portal, and there are over 272,000 data sets now available from federal organizations. This has just all happened in the last couple of years. Today, I can announce uh, that three more departments have joined the effort, and approximately 150 new data sets have been made available. Uh, we will also be developing the next generation platform for the delivery of this open data, and this will include better search capabilities, more web uh, 2.0 features, and open data standards. And, uh, but while I'm here in Regina, I better congratulate the city for embracing open government too, because uh, this city became in February the first government in Saskatchewan to launch an internet-based open data portal. And I understand that data from the city has already spurred the founder of Open Data SK.ca to develop new mobile phone applications. And that's that's the beauty of open data for small businesses. When you have this data, you can actually create mobile apps that businesses can create uh, and uh, 
create services for citizens that citizens are willing to buy. So it's good for business as well as good for government. Finally, just a few brief words about open dialogue. Uh, it's obviously another important feature of open government and our action plan. We're going to be uh, using uh, Web 2.0 tools, and we want to give Canadians a stronger say in government policies and priorities, get people more engaged. Uh, we want to tap into their ideas and talents, and we'll be using things like crowdsourcing, where we can get a bunch of people together of, uh, who have an interest in a particular file or a particular public policy goal, and get their points of view and make sure we can be more responsive to their needs and expectations. That's what my Twitter town hall was all about, where we had hundreds, literally hundreds of tweets come in in a space of uh, just a few minutes in both official languages, by the way. <coughs> and uh, some of the ideas were very helpful uh, today with uh, creating the plan that I'm announcing today. Uh, they also, Canadians also told us they want to include tools and websites for engaging them, and so we'll be exploring options for a new citizen engagement platform. Okay, so we'll also be providing guidance to federal departments on the use of Web 2.0 technologies for conducting public consultations, developing ideas and solutions uh, and for, through crowdsourcing, as I mentioned, and reporting on the results. I really believe that these things will help us with innovation. Uh, it's not just about uh, the dialogue between the citizen and the public. It's about uh, more innovation, more economic opportunity, uh, and really uh, getting us to the forefront again where Canada used to be when it comes to online. And uh, I hope you'll find that this new action plan will help your businesses uh, in your, your goals, your information goals, just as it will help citizens from across the country. Just to sum up then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just feeding back to the, the budget once again. I, I hope you'll agree with us that we're taking measured steps that will grow our economy. Uh, and this really is perhaps the base, most basic responsibility of government, to foster the prosperity that underpins our quality of life. Uh, but all of this, uh, keeping our fiscal house in order, helping Canadians and their businesses to succeed, making the public service more efficient, uh, is more than just the story of good government. It's the story of Canadians and our optimism. We believe in ourselves. We have faith in our future. And we are striving for our full potential. And I fully believe that Budget 2012 will help us do just that. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, expressed it best in his speech uh, at Davos, uh, Switzerland, uh, earlier this winter, when he called on world leaders to make tough but necessary choices. Canada's choice, he said, will be with clarity and urgency to seize and to master our future, to be a model of confidence, growth, and prosperity in the 21st century. That's what he said, and that was more than a challenge just to world leaders. It really was a call to Canadians to remember how we got to our successes to date and with the confidence that we have to build on our future together. Thank you very much. Minister, I've got a few questions. I think you may have answered some of them, but I'll ask them anyways. Uh, what measures will the federal government be taking to facilitate immigration to address skill shortages in Western Canada? So I, I absolutely did answer that, and, and I just want you to know this is something that comes up not only in Saskatchewan, by the way, when I do roundtables in Ontario, businesses say their biggest problem is finding the right skilled people to help them. So we have heard that loud and clear. That's why we do. Tom does these things as well. Uh, all of our uh, conservative MPs, pre-budget, we go around the country, we hold roundtables with citizens and businesses, and we we feed that feedback into the budget process. And that's what we were hearing, quite frankly. That uh, we it wasn't it wasn't all about unemployment. It was the the opposite issue, which was matching the right people with the skills needs that businesses have. So we've heard that message loud and clear. You'll be hearing from us in the weeks ahead. Great. Just because the opportunities here, you were here the last time. Do you have any comment? You don't have to answer this one. Do you have any comments on the Viterra deal and what the federal government will be looking for? Um, well, uh, I'm still waiting for that statute we built on. <laughs> uh, on the VAC deal. But uh, look, um, I, I, can, I, I can only speak as a former minister. I don't know the details of. of uh, but 
if this is a reviewable case. Uh, it's very clear in the Investment Canada Act that uh, there has to be a net benefit to Canada. And there's a series of tools in the toolbox in the Investment Canada Act to judge whether uh, an investment is of net benefit to Canada. So uh, if this is reviewable, then uh, the minister will, my successor, uh, will have on his shoulders the burden of going through that process. And the act is very clear. Uh, it's the minister. Uh, you know, uh, he, he or she has that burden. And you take it very seriously. I can tell you from experience with the BHP deal, you take that very seriously. And uh, you really remove, you remove yourself from politics because it doesn't say in the investment Canada Act, look at the politics of the deal. It says, look at the net benefit of Canada. And that's the only test you can apply. And uh, that's how I did it. And I'm sure my successor, if this is reviewable, will do the same thing. Great. Last question I have. I believe you've answered uh, most of this. I don't have the right glasses on today, sir. Uh, do you see open government policies helping to reduce red tape? Yeah, I, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of things coming together to reduce red tape. But first of all, we've got the uh, recommendations. There's over 100 recommendations from the Red Tape Reduction Commission. So I'll be, you'll be hearing from me later about how we're going to chunk all those out and, and, and really. And some of these recommendations, by the way, are very specific. Uh, so uh, you know, we've heard from businesses. It's not just like, you know, reduce red tape, please. It's you know, this department or this division of this department with this red tape rule is killing business. Please do something about this particular rule. So we're getting, we've got lots of examples where we can really follow up. And so you'll be hearing from me on that. And the, 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 the good news about open government is if we can keep the dialogue going, uh, you know, we're going to be getting lots of other feedback on uh, rules that are either misapplied or don't work anymore or too much a burden on business without any uh, resulting uh, benefit to society. So, you know, keep those cards and letters coming. We'll have to have a way to, to definitely uh, uh, keep active on this, on this, on this spot. Great. Well, Minister, thank you very much for all you do for Canadians across the country. Thank you.